Well, hey guys, it's Mr. Schauber. Hopefully you're doing well, and welcome to our presentation on the causes and effects of the Great Depression. The questions I put on here were, what led to the Great Depression, and how did it affect this country and its people? The Great Depression uh, started really October 29th, 1929, right, with the stock market crash, and it carried over throughout the whole decade, basically, of the 1930s. Not everybody was terribly affected by it. Some people were absolutely uh, affected by it, and, but, but everybody was affected in some way. Uh, some people lost everything and, and really struggled during the Great Depression. Other people you know, kept their jobs and, and still made ends meet. Some, of course, the rich people that from before the Depression, the really rich, uh, were still really rich. Okay, and so uh, the Great Depression really affects the middle class and lower class, which is the bulk of society. But again, some people uh, had their lives turned upside down and other people uh, continued on with life, maybe not completely normal to what they had been used to, but, but continued on okay. But everybody's life was affected in some way just because of what happened in society. So let's look at these. So as we look at this in more detail now, what is a recession and what is a depression? A recession is a slowdown in the cycle, the economic cycle. It basically, like I wrote on here, means just some just less spending. Businesses get hurt a little bit, slow, they slow down a little bit. Uh, because of that, some people lose their jobs uh, or get hours cut or wages cut. Um, and you know, think of it like a roller coaster. The economic cycle is like a roller coaster, but a, a recession is a is a little dip. Okay, a depression has basically the same issues as a recession, but the problems are more pronounced. I wrote on here more serious. Uh, the depression lasts longer than a recession, and it's harder to get out of once you're in that cycle. Now we'll look at the cycle here. In a little bit, but um, a recession is a slowdown. A depression is is a major hit to the economic cycle. And so, uh, how many depressions and recessions have we had? Well, we've had a lot of recessions, and that, that seems to happen. You know, every number of years, you have a just a downturn in the economy. But true or false, I guess we've only had one major depression in our country's history. The answer is false. Uh, we've had we've had numerous economic depressions in this country's history. It's just that in the 1800s they were usually called panics. The depression of the 1930s, the one we're talking about currently, was probably the worst one we've had, and at least up to that point. And so uh, that's why we just we simply know this as the Great Depression. But there were other economic depressions uh, in our history before this. So what led to the depression? What could have, you know, what were the factors that went into this? Because how could you have a decade worth of just really economic hard times? Well, there must have been factors. There must have been causes. So let's look at how each one of these causes, and I have five of them listed here, how each one led to and contributed to the depression. First is overproduction. Uh, companies had done overall very well during most of the 1920s, and therefore they continued to make a lot of products. You know, and, and for most of the decade, you make the products and people buy them, and and you're you're doing great. But once the slowdown kind of started in the very late 20s, and especially after the stock market crashed, companies still had a lot of product, but when they couldn't sell it, all of a sudden. Then it was just sitting on their shelves and the companies lost money. So businesses get hurt financially, which leads to slowing or stopping production, and then they start laying off workers. Then they start or they cut wages, they cut hours. And so overproduction is never a good thing for a business, especially when you end up not being able to sell all those items that you produced. 
So that was one factor. Another factor is the buying on credit idea or the installment buying. Very popular in the 20s, like it is today. Uh, some people were buying more than their wages allowed for, like today. Uh, this, When you do that, though, this leads to the economy appearing to be better than it was. Because if people are buying so much on credit, they're taking home their product today, but not necessarily paying for it all today. And so the businesses that are selling these products, you know, are, they're, they're getting rid of the product. And it looks like, you know, the business is zooming. It looks like the economy is zooming. Uh, but, and that's fine as long as people pay their bills. But sometimes the bills catch up to the consumers and they might pay them, but now they have less money to buy other new things. Or sometimes people couldn't pay their bills for the products they had bought on credit. And, uh, you know, once in a while, businesses might be able to recoup or uh, repossess that product. But if a lot of people can't pay the bills, the businesses can't, can't repossess all those products and the businesses are the ones that get hurt. So this is what happens uh, by the late 20s into the early 30s, we start to see the result of this, but too much buying on credit, and sometimes people couldn't pay the bills. Also, the issue of tariffs. Now, tariffs are taxes on imported and or exported goods. There were high tariffs in this country on imports from foreign countries in the 1920s. It was designed to get people to buy American-made products and to protect American businesses. And so, uh, and that's great, but foreign companies, at foreign countries, I should say, saw what we were doing and said, well, okay, we'll, we'll just kind of retaliate. We'll do the same thing. We'll have high import tariffs on American made goods and coming to our country. And the issue was that a lot of American companies were doing business in foreign countries at this time probably more so than foreign companies were doing business in our country. So uh, American businesses are the ones that end up getting hurt by this more so than, than foreign companies. And so uh, this is gonna contribute as well. Continuing on with this, a fourth cause. The stock market crash. This is the immediate cause of the Great Depression, right? This is the one we always look to and point to and say, well, yeah, this is when it started. And the thing was, it was kind of a long time in coming. It didn't happen overnight. Uh, if people, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. If we could look back now, we look back now on it and say, ah, why couldn't people see this coming? Why couldn't people see this happening in front of their eyes? Well, when you're in the moment, it's not so simple. And Stock prices had been unrealistically high during the, especially the later part of the decade, because people kept buying and it overinflated the, the prices. A bubble, so to speak, formed. And it looked like the stocks and the companies were doing better than they probably really were. So when prices finally start to drop a little bit, uh, people start to sell and they want out and they sell off their stocks, their shares and it causes a panic. So you got five people who sell off their shares and the sixth guy over here and the seventh guy and the eighth guy who also have shares in the same company see those five people sell off their stocks and, they, and these three guys go, hey, wait a minute, do these guys know something I don't? Is the, is the company failing? Is the company in trouble? And so they sell off their stocks too. And now you've got eight people who've sold. Pretty soon it turns to 80, then 800, then 8,000. And it, it's a panic that goes on. And, uh, of course, prices will crash. When everybody sells their stock and dumps it, prices crash. And businesses, whether they were really in trouble or not, are uh, before, now, they're, now they are in trouble, right? Because their stock values have plummeted. And so that's gonna be a major factor. And finally, banks, okay? Bank closures, most banks stayed open uh, during at least some of the first year after the crash. So from late October of 1929 until late October of 1930, uh, you're gonna have quite a few banks still doing business. The problem is that during the 20s, a lot of banks had made really bad investments. They'd given out risky loans. Uh, they just, like I wrote on here, had practiced bad policies. And so 
there was also no guarantee of deposits for for the patrons or people who kept their money in the bank. So people start pulling out their money from their bank accounts after the stock market crashes for that first year. And eventually the bank doesn't have everybody's money on hand, right? The banks have loaned it out for other things. And so the first people to uh, get to the bank, so to speak, to get their cash out and clean out their savings accounts, they get their money. But those who get there too late don't get their money. And like I said, there's no guarantee of deposits. So, you know, if you get there too late and all the money's already been pulled out of the bank, the bank has no more money in the vaults, you know, the other people that got there are doing fine because they have their cash in hand now. They got their, their bank account uh, in their hand uh, cleaned out, you know, but you don't have yours. It's not there. The money's gone. And like I said here, the bank vaults are empty. The banks go bankrupt. And a lot of people lost their entire life savings. Okay. And so within the first year of, of after the stock market crash, 800 banks in the country will fail, will go under because people make what's called a run on the banks and they pull all their money out. And now the banks have no cash and they go bankrupt. So you can see how these five factors, and there were probably others, but these five major factors of overproduction, of um, tariffs, of uh, you know stock market crashing, bank closures, uh, all these things we've talked about, you can see how these really will impact and, and lead to a, a Great Depression. And so what is the depression cycle? There's a cycle here that happens. And you could probably start anywhere on the cycle, but for our purposes, we will start with less spending by consumers. You and I, the people, start spending less money at businesses, okay, at, at stores, at restaurants, and things like that. We start spending less money, which leads to businesses suffering. Businesses get hurt, and now they're selling less stuff, so now they have a problem of overproduction. They have too much stuff laying around. And they can't sell it, and you know it, it, it hurts their bottom line. This then leads to wages getting cut, hours getting cut, people losing their jobs because businesses aren't doing as much business, and now they they're losing money and they have to let people go or at least cut wages and hours. And that then leads eventually to unemployment. People finally, you know, without jobs. And of course, then the cycle starts over. If you're if you don't have a job, it's going to be very hard to spend money on stuff. So you spend less money and that leads to businesses getting hurt again and cut wages and hours and jobs and unemployment. And you can see how the, the cycle just repeats itself. The problem is, how do you get out of the cycle? How do you get out of it? And there are different philosophies and theories on how to do this, but how do you get out of this cycle? That's the key. Uh, eventually these cycles will correct themselves, but in a, in a depression, it usually takes quite a while to do that. And there's a lot of uh, a lot of people that suffer because of it. And so uh, this is this is the cycle that that we plunge into during the 1930s, and uh, very difficult to to reverse the cycle. Now, how was farming affected by the Great Depression? Let's look at a few of these different groups: so farmers, minorities, and just the average American family. Uh, farmers, there was a surplus of farm goods during the 1930s, at least for some of it, because farmers had all this product, but now people have less money to buy things. And so the surplus of goods drives prices down, which is good for the consumer that needs to buy food, but it's bad for the farmers who can't make a profit now. And if the farmers can't make money on their products, then they're not able to pay their farm mortgage. They're not able to, you know, keep the farm. They lose it. And so farmers are hurt by the Great Depression as much uh, as, as maybe any other group. So how are families affected by the Great Depression? In general, the American family, well, about a quarter, 25% of American families were unemployed during the Great Depression, at least at some point which again, 
means that, you know, upwards of 75% of people still had jobs during the Depression. It wasn't like everybody was out of work, but 25% unemployment is extremely high. And so there were also very few women and teenagers in the workplace because the guys were looking for jobs. And whereas women and teenagers had worked more, uh, especially women during the during World War One and stuff, while many of the guys were off fighting, uh, the 1920s, then also you had a lot of women working. You had kids sometimes, teenagers working uh, a little bit. But in, in, when, the, when there's hardly any jobs to, to go around, now it's going to be the guys who are looking for those and the other groups of people are kind of out. And so uh, a lot of families found different ways to cope, uh, to deal with this. You know, some uh, fed their kids every other day. You know, there was kind of a, a saying, you know, it's my, it's my brother's turn to eat today. If your family might be in that position, can you imagine how hard that would be? Uh, a popular saying of the day was, wear it out, make it do, eat it up. Uh, you did not waste things. You did not buy, just buy new pants if you got a hole in, in your pants, right? You, or you get a hole in your sock, you stitch it up. You didn't have money to buy new stuff. At least most people didn't. And so you wore it out and, and you, you make do with what you've got and you do not waste food. And you, you know, everything on your plate, you better eat it. And that's just how it goes. And, uh, you know, we'd probably be better off as a society today if we still live by this mantra. But, uh, you know, nowadays, a lot of times we, we get a hole in our sock and we throw it away. We buy a new one, you know, or buy a new pair and, and, you, and you, you, your clothes wear out, you buy new ones, you know, and stuff. And, and so times have changed. I don't know. For better or worse, but times have changed for sure. So, but that's how the average American family was affected by the depression. How are cities affected by the depression? Well, the number of homeless and unemployed, of course, goes up. People lose jobs. They can't make their house payments. They, they lose their house, right? Uh, and so obviously hunger increased as well. So soup kitchens were created by charities, churches, other groups. Uh, to give people free meals. And it usually wasn't a whole lot. Uh, a lot of times, you know, just be a little bit of soup, maybe a piece of bread, but it was, it was something, it was food in the stomach. Right. And so, um, you know, they, people would, would say that you're on the bread line, so to speak, you're on the bread line. If you're having to go to the soup kitchens and stand in line to get a piece of bread and some soup. Right. And, and so kind of the wilder life of the twenties gave way to much more conservative way of life in the 30s and much more conservative in, in style of dress and and just, you know, everyday living, okay, uh, was affected. And so absolutely, uh, cities start to have a different feel and look to them during the 1930s. And how were minority groups affected by the Depression? Well, unfortunately for them, they were often blamed for the Depression. Being a minority group, a lot of times you get the finger pointed at you, right? Because you're the minority and somebody's looking for someone else to blame. And so uh, they get targeted for this. You know, they, they were often the first ones fired and the last ones hired. And so unemployment rates among minority groups are were generally higher uh, during the Great Depression, which, you know, sad deal. And it was just a hard time for so many people all around. And so, but this is, this is one of the, the effects of it. All right, so what was the government reaction to the Depression? As you will see, we're going to compare and contrast uh, the plans for solving the Depression by Presidents Hoover and Roosevelt. Each had their own philosophy on what they thought was best for getting the country out of the Depression. Uh, each of their plans had its positives and its negatives. Neither of them really got us out of the Depression uh, totally. That was World War II that pretty much did that. but. Let's look at each of these presidents' theories and, and to briefly discuss them. So first you have Herbert Hoover from 1929 to 1933. He won the election of 1928, took over in early 1929, and was only in office for eight or nine months when the stock market crashes. And he basically gets blamed for it. It wasn't his fault, of course not, but uh, he gets blamed for it being the president. And of course, as the country 
gets further and further into trouble, into problems, as 1930 and 31 and 32 go by, uh, he is basically public enemy number one, and he has no chance of winning re-election in the presidential election of 1932. So, but his theory for trying to help the country was called the trickle-down theory. You can see government, business, workers. The idea was that the government would help businesses with with financial um, you know with money with with loans with whatever they needed to do uh, financially and therefore businesses would then be able to stay in existence keep their workers and um, then the businesses uh, being able to hire people and being able to you know keep wages then people would turn around and you know reciprocate and buy things from the businesses so it was very much a top-down theory, uh, but as you can see, then the government helps businesses who hire more workers and raise wages. That's that's the ideal, right? Uh, that was the you know perfect scenario for this situation. Did it work for those few years? Well, yes and no. Right? Again, there were positives and negatives. The government did give businesses money and and financial help. Uh, in in and in turn, the businesses did hire people and. Uh, you know, more, more people, got, you know, got jobs, but it, it really wasn't enough is the problem. And you can't just expect the government to load businesses up with money so they can hire workers and so forth. That's just not how the economy is going to successfully run. So this was Hoover's attempt. He was a smart guy in a lot of ways, but uh, he, he becomes so unpopular because of how bad the depression gets by the time he's done being president that uh, no chance to win re-election. And so Franklin D. Roosevelt, FDR, gets elected in 1932 and assumes office in 1933. You will see that Roosevelt was our president for over 12 years. He actually got elected four times and served a few months into his fourth term before he passed away. So three full terms and a few months of the fourth term. He's the only president ever elected more than twice there was no law back then limiting the president to two terms. And so uh, he he kept winning and he, uh, you know, saw no reason to stop being our president. So, uh, but while the Great Depression is going, he comes in and he's got uh, kind of a different theory. His philosophy is called priming the pump. This is, you still have uh, the same structure as the trickle down, the government, business and workers. But what you're doing is kind of the inverse, if you will, of what Hoover did. The government gave money not to the businesses, but to workers. So welfare uh, programs and Social Security benefits, these are new programs that come in. Um, and, you know, and some, some cash bailouts, if you will. And we've seen that in recent history as well. But government gives money to the workers who then spend it buy things, and this helps businesses. And then in turn, businesses would, of course, pay taxes back up to the government, but businesses would also ideally stay in business because they would be getting supported by, uh, you know, the common person who, you know, who had a little bit of money to spend and who might get hired by one of these businesses and therefore have a job. So this was the idea, but it couldn't only be based on government business and then the worker. The government as well had to get involved, or at least chose to get involved with FDR, and do government projects. Now, they did a few with Hoover as well, but under FDR, the government is going to grow in size exponentially. The government's going to start getting involved in people's daily life much more, and the government's going to fund a lot of projects that are going to hire people right, to give them a paycheck and to build things for the country and roads and and uh, infrastructure and dams and schoolhouses and you name it, okay? So that's the idea. Again, neither of these gets us out of the Depression. Which one did more? Well, it could be argued, uh, but probably FDRs for the average person did a little more. Hoover hesitated making the government too much a part of people's lives. And FDR said, uh, that's what we're going to do. So th those are the different philosophies.
So when the Depression started, what kinds of welfare systems existed to help care for the, the needy individuals? And, and we just kind of went over this. There were no systems in place for the government to help people when the Depression first starts. President Hoover did not want the government to, to really become a big factor in people's lives. He didn't want people to become dependent on the government for support. And he wanted people to rely more on their family and their friends and, and charities if need be. So there were, there were no programs when, when the stock market first crashed, when bank closures first happened, and when the Depression really got going. Uh, those government programs really came in under FDR. Uh, President Roosevelt and his administration really started a lot of those. And, of course, we, you know, for better or worse, they haven't gone away mainly, right? Today we see kind of the, the product of what FDR started, and, and the government has just kept growing and growing and growing in size over the decades. And, and now there are a million different, you know, bureaucratic agencies that handle different programs. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's ballooned uh, for sure. But uh, that's no really, no programs when the, when the Depression first starts. Programs will be developed after. And so because Hoover resisted creating government programs and so forth, uh, when FDR comes in, he calls his, pro his new ideas and set of programs the New Deal. Okay, and this is kind of, this goes along with what we saw with, the, uh, with his priming the pump theory. Uh, Roosevelt's New Deal, in essence, was his plan to end the Depression. It included government programs for jobs, as well as some handouts to get people back on their feet. Uh, basically, he got his New Deal term, he likened life to a card game, and he, and he saw it uh, and said that, you know, we had been dealt, the people had been dealt, uh, or were, were needed to be dealt, a new deal of cards, uh, because everyone had been dealt a bad hand. So it was like a poker game for him, right? Kind of thing like, okay, you've all had a bad hand. Uh, you're down in the dumps. You, you, it's tough for you, but we're going to give you a new deal of cards, so to speak, right? A new deal on life. And so, uh, again, it was full of government programs, government projects to give people jobs and to have them, you know, put back to work. You weren't going to get wealthy working in these government jobs and doing these projects, but it was a paycheck. And uh, for some people, that was, you know, really that was what they were really looking for, obviously. So, um, but that was the New Deal. A lot of people liked the New Deal, but some people didn't. And as history has gone on, some historians think it was a great thing to, to implement the New Deal. Other historians uh, don't think it was so great. So, again, it's hard to please everybody, right? Pretty much impossible. Uh, usually to please everybody. But here were some of the criticisms of the New Deal. Uh, some people that didn't like it just thought it greatly increased the size and scope of government in people's lives. And it certainly did that. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is an opinion, but it certainly increased the size of government and its role in people's lives. Some saw it as a form of socialism because of all the government involvement, all the government programs. And and socialism has, you know, had long been frowned upon in, in, uh, in American history and still oftentimes is. But uh, it's a, just a different uh, system than capitalism. And, and America has traditionally been a very capitalistic nation. Some people said that it put the nation in, into much deeper debt because of all the government spending on the new programs. And it certainly did increase the debt. And so, again, whether that was good or bad as an opinion. Uh, people that thought, you know, some people thought the other way on this said, well, wait a minute, we had to go into debt to create these projects, to fund these projects, and to give people paychecks to work on the projects. And this was the only way to get people uh, back in the workforce and get them going again. So they they thought the the uh, that the benefit in the end outweighed the cost. And again, that was just a matter of opinion. Um, some people saw it as unconstitutional, as the government was now going far beyond its powers outlined in the Constitution. Well, uh, the, you know, yes, was it going beyond its powers? For sure. Uh, other people, though, said, well, we had to do that because of, of the times. Again, this is, was it good? Was it bad? Well, always two sides to a story. But some people said they criticized the, the New Deal for different reasons. Some people said it didn't go far enough in helping to solve uh, the crisis we were in, and, and they said that they wanted the government to do more. 
And so, again, hard, pretty much impossible to please everybody. But in the end, did the New Deal pull us out of the Great Depression? No, it did not. World War II uh, would be required to do that. But did it help some people get jobs and get back on their feet? Yes, it did that for some people. So, were there parts of the New Deal that were good? Yes. Were there parts that were maybe not so good and were criticized? Yes. And so uh, history, you know, I guess it just depends on on uh, a person's view on how, how much government involvement they want in people's lives, what role they think government plays in people's lives, uh, you know, and to what degree uh, that role extends. Um, and, and that's just what it comes down to. But this is basically a summary then of some of the causes and results of the Great Depression and uh, a very difficult decade for Americans and really for the world because the, the Great Depression uh, was impacting most of the world at this time during the 1930s and not just the United States. So thank you for watching the presentation. I hope you learned something and talk to you later.